All right, hey everybody, uh, it's Chris. What's happening is yesterday I had a big long session where I sat and I quietly worked and you could kind of see what was going on. And I, I wanted to explain what I was doing for those people who didn't know. And largely this is for the purposes of being put on uh, YouTube so people who are in time zones where they couldn't see or whatever can see. But I, people seem to have an interest in this. Uh, I will now change this to, I am explaining the uh, single player scripting system. There we go. Uh, okay. So there's four tabs, missions, actions, dialogues, regiments. We'll start with regiments. For those of you who know anything about the game, uh, when you play the game, one of the key elements of the game is you've got your regiment, which kind of serves as your deck for the game. So it's composed of two heroes and a number of units. And those units, in theory, should be units that the heroes can summon, right? So one of the things that we're going to need, not just for the single player missions, but for the AI and everything else, is I will need to have the game choose reasonable regiments and to create an ai that can look and create a set of regiment you know a set up to build a deck that makes sense and eh, we can we can fight that all we want but the realistic truth is i can sit down and make 15 or 20 decks you know in a couple hours so by the time i ship this game i can easily make you know 100 decks that you know of regiments that are reasonable fun to play balanced decks and so this is where i'm going to do that and so each one will get an ID, so regiment one. It will get a name, which is a, a text string. And for those who don't know how this works, the way we work with text strings in this game, um, you know, this right now I might type in something like, you know, Bob's Killers. Um, but I'm not actually going to leave Bob's Killers there. What I would actually do is I would change this to something like reg001 underscore name, right? Um, and actually, probably, I won't even bother doing that. Probably what will happen is the, the code will say, okay, here's an ID. I'm going to attach an underscore name to it. And then somewhere else, there's a file where I've got reg underscore 001 underscore name is attached to some string of text. And the reason we do that is so that we can localize it. So later on, if I want to put this game in Japanese, I can actually put another column in where I say, okay, uh, reg001 underscore name in English is Bob's Killers. Um, but in Japanese, it's uh, Bob no, I don't know how to say killers. Let's say ninja, Bob no ninja. And there we go. Uh, then they get an emblem. The emblem is in each regiment has its own special emblem. Again, we can make a random generator for emblems, but when we do that, they always end up coming out kind of crap because it's like, oh, that one's pink and green and has a drag. Like, they just don't look good. Uh, there is a human element to making art, and it's actually way easier for me to go in and spend a Saturday somewhere along the line and build 100 emblems and just throw the emblems here and be done, and then they all look good. Um, the next is the AI type. This is, uh, what kind of AI is this regiment going to use? And the reason I'm attaching it here and not somewhere else is because the next three are which two heroes is he going to bring and which other units is he going to bring. And let's say I create a very defensive type AI, I probably want to attach that to a regiment that has defensive kind of units. That makes sense, right? So now I can craft a little AI. Here's now a player that I can put in the game. And I can put him in single player as someone I want to show up in my single player campaigns. Or I can actually use him later as I can use this this uh, this file as the place where I draw all of my AI for the, the multiplayer games. So let's say I set up a multiplayer game with two human players and four AI players. It can go randomly pick four players from this list. And later on, I'll populate the list out with lots and lots of things, right? And it'll pull those and they'll have a nice emblem and they'll have an AI type and they'll have heroes and units that go with them and all that. And they'll even have a fun name. So that's the simplest part. Now that I know my regiments, the next thing I need to do is I need to set up a map, a single player map. When I set up a single player map, um, I'm going to give, so there's, there's a differentiation between a map and a mission, right? So when we say, oh, I played this map. A map is actually a thing that I went and built in the editor. So let's say I crack open the build folder. In the build folder, I play last regiment. 
and I go into the editor and then in the editor I build a new map. When I build a new map, it's going to have a map name here. The map name is actually not what we're calling. Uh, that's that's some other thing. Um, when I save this map, here I'll create it real quick. So there's a map. And then when I save the map, it's actually going to have what I saved it as. Um, so let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Working projects, hex. All right. Um, so if I go into this build folder, there's probably a world folder in the world folder. Here's all the maps. Um, so here's the name of the map. So this is the actual thing that we're looking for. This is the map name. This is what the map exists as. So for instance, this map might be four player Wolf's Blood, which is the name of the Wolf's Blood map. So I save that out, right? And that information is going to go uh, right here. That's the map ID from editor. So now I know my first line of my, my map is okay, what map is this mission going to use? Because there's a difference between maps and missions. A mission, I could actually create four or five different missions using the same map file. Let's say I had like a take the castle mission. And then after that, I had a whole nother mission that was the defend the castle mission. And then after that, I had another one which was attack from the castle mission. I could do all of those using the same map ID from the map that I saved in the editor. So line number one, in this mission, what map am I gonna use? And so, You'll notice for all of these, I'm actually um, putting parameters at the end. And this is this is the way this whole system works is here's an element and then the element has parameters that go with it. And importantly, this is something uh, game designers get wrong all the time. When you're putting together a data file like this, think of it as a series of records, right? Each one of these rows in my Excel file is a specific record. And actually, all of the information that I need about this record is contained within that line, um, including what is it going to be used for, what does it come before, what does it come after. I don't ever want to have something based on the ordering or, okay, this one comes after this one, and that has me. You don't want the world to be like that. You want it to be a bunch of little capsulated uh, records that can be ordered in whatever way you want. So later on, I can say, show me all the maps or show me all the players or show me all the whatever. And I can sort, when you, when we get the bigger sheets, you'll see what I mean. All of our sheets are designed like that so that every record is its own independent thing. So I've told it, uh, what map do I want it to be? I want it to be this map. The next thing is I may want to assign some points on a map. Now there's two ways I should open up my game again, real quick. Um, do, 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 do. So let's go open up a map real quick. Um, just for shits and giggles, I'll play any map. Uh, we were talking about Wolf's Blood a second ago. Let's open up that map. So here's a map. Now, one of the nice things about uh, this game in terms of editing and all that other fun stuff is we actually are a hex-based game. So as a hex-based game, I can assign a hex number to, to everything. Um, here I can show my hex grid lines. So we can actually say, you know, this hex is 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, right? So we can we can do it. It's a hex coordinate system. So this might be hex 24 down, 8 across. So 24, 8. Actually, I think it would be 8, 24. I think you usually do the x coordinate before the y coordinate. I think that's how that works. Anyway, um, that's now I can actually say this spot right here is, let's say, 24, 8. Right now, I don't have that written, but it would be trivial for us to put a little thing where the computer, you know, when I'm in the editor, I can click the show me the coordinate button. Now, this isn't for the player. This is for the editor of the game. Um, he can actually call up this number and say, all right, that's the hex coordinate. So once I know that hex coordinate, I might want to not always have to remember the hex ID. So hex ID for something would be hex, and then in the parameters here, it would say uh, like 3344. So that tells me look at point 3344 on the map. Now, what I want to do is I want to be able to say, you know what, I want to assign a name to that point. I'm going to call that uh, waypoint player one hero start. And so now when I'm doing my scripting later, I don't have to remember or go look up, oh shit, where was the player start? I know that, you know, I've standardized it and the player start is that. So I can actually assign a series of waypoints across the map like that. And I can assign as many as I want. I can assign 15. As long as I tag them all M001, I know these are waypoints that only really matter for mission 001, which is set on this map. Pretty straightforward. Next thing I'm gonna to wanna to do on this map is I will want to, uh, I wanna say, 
who's on this map, right? So obviously, um, there's the player player. So now I'm, and then, and then there's also the AI players, right? So I would set up, okay, uh, this is player one. Player one has, will be using what regiment? Well, the, I'll pull it from this file that has an ID. The IT tag is regiment 001. So, all right, set me up with regiment and then inside of this. So I would say something like uh, regiment reg underscore zero zero one. So now I know for player one, why don't you go ahead and use regiment zero zero one? Now remember, we already assigned a name to him and an emblem and an AI to him, but it might be the case that because I'm setting up a single player mission, I want to use that regiment, but I want to alter those details a little bit because it's a little different. Now I could obviously just set up another version of him over here, but I'm going to end up with a thousand regiments over here, and that sucks. And it also sucks because this special version might not be something that I want to have show up in multiplayer. It might be something special to single player. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, all right, here's some other stuff that you can add, which will replace the data that shows up over in regiments. So for instance, if I don't like the name that was over in regiments, I can actually type in name and then whatever the hell text I want. So maybe I'll call this uh, maple, maples happy campers. Right, so there we go. Now Maple's Happy Campers can be the name of the thing, even though back here I actually set up the regiment name as, you know, Bob's Builders. Right, so now Regiment 1 says, oh, your name Bob's Builders, but actually over in this campaign, Chris wants to name it something different. So now over here, they're Maple's Happy Campers, right? And I can do that for the emblem, etc. I can also set uh, starting gold. Now, usually when a player starts the game, the starting gold is determined by whatever buildings are assigned to him. And if I go over to the editor again, actually, this is not the editor. This is the game. Let me go back to the editor real quick. Um, if I go back to the editor, uh, do, 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 I'll load one of our maps. We were just looking at Wolf's Blood, so we'll load that map up. So here's Wolfblood in the editor, right? So I can scroll out and in the editor, I can assign things to stuff. So let's say for instance, I want player one to start out with a village right next to him. I can say, ah, oh, here's a village. I'll stick that village here and you know what? I'll make it a bigger village. And now I can go and assign some stuff to that village. So you know what? I'm gonna put some walls around that village. I'll put some walls around that village too. Now it's a nice big happy walled village. Now I want to say, now right now that village doesn't belong to anybody. I can say, hey, you know what? This one, that one now belongs to player one. Uh, that one also now belongs to player one. Theoretically, I'm supposed to hit the apply button, but uh, I, for whatever reason, you don't have to. It's kind of cool. Um, and I can even name it. So I might call this one, uh, let's name this village. Come on. There we go. Uh, text editor is crappy. We'll call this village Spaghetti. So this is North Spaghetti. And I'll call this southern one uh, South Spaghetti. So now I've got a village named Spaghetti that's composed of two parts. Come on, the text editor in this is really crappy. Um, we have to fix that. Uh, so this is South Spaghetti. I think I'm spelling Spaghetti, right? Um, so now I have this village, which is called North and South Spaghetti. Um, so there's all that. Um, I would get into the editor more, but this isn't the, that today we're not talking editor. We'll talk about editor more, but the point is usually the way that we compute gold is when player one starts with these two villages, we say these villages have a gold cap of X, whatever the gold cap for that village is. And we say, when you start the game, you're going to start with enough gold that all of your cap is filled. So if you started with two villages and each village gave you a gold cap of 100 gold, you would start the game with 200 gold plus whatever gold this portal gives you, which actually is zero. So back here, I can actually say, because maybe in a single player mission, I want somebody to uh, start the game with, uh, what do I want to say? I want somebody to start the game with more gold then they should be getting, or less gold, I can actually state that right here. And I can say, all right, uh, this gold, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so now they actually start with 40 gold instead, right? So there's all that. Um, so the next bit of this is 
uh, players. So we, we sorted the players. The last one is the unit. So maybe I want to start the game with a couple extra. Here, part of what I can do is I can make this bigger. Uh, there, maybe that's easier to read now. Um, so one of the things I can do is I can say, you know what, I want to have some extra units that are not part of the normal setup. So let's say I want to start the player, you know, player one and single player with a whole bunch of cavalry spread all across the screen. So I can actually say team one, whatever player I've assigned to team one, right, uh, which here I assign this player team one, right? So now this unit is also team one, right? So this player now starts with whatever unit type I want, and I can set that at whatever hex I want. Or if I had declared a waypoint like this one, I could actually put them at those waypoints. So I might type something uh, that looks like, uh, let's see here, do, 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 do. now that's so big I can't see what I'm doing. I might type something that says like type, um, and then the way that we name the factions is like the units actually got its own code, which is like faction uh, zero one underscore unit uh, zero two, and that might be something like uh, heavy, heavy horse or something like that. So I want one of these units, and I want to stick that at point, and then because I defined the waypoint uh, underscore p one hero start. Now it knows, hey, when the game starts, can you please put a uh, whatever the hell that unit is, um, which I would find over in the, the unit screen, go put one of these units um, over in the hero start. So that's, that's what that means. Um, that's what that achieves. So next thing, um, now, that I've, now that I've sorted out all of my, my mission data and I've put all my waypoints down, I've declared what map I want, I've declared who all the players are going to be. So if it's a six player game, I would have six of these players listed. I've added all my additional units. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the actions tab, which is a way bigger and way more complicated tab. Uh, but don't be scared. Chris is going to explain it all to you. So again, we're using the same basic theory which is I have uh, uh, anything that's marked M001. That means this is part of mission one, which we just set up over in our missions. So mission 001 uses this map, uses these points, uses these players, blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to say in mission one, um, the first thing I'm going to want to say is what, what am I asking the player to do? What, what, what am I, you know, what are his goals, right? And these goals might be something like occupy this hex or defend this unit or defend this structure or destroy this unit. And each one of these goals would come with some prerequisites. Um, and this prerequisite could be another goal, it could be a trigger, or it could be an event. And what I mean by goals, triggers, and events, all of these things are given a type. So the type goal means this is something I'm asking the player to do. like. Here, defend this hex or go kill 15 horsemen or something like that. Here's a goal for you. Here's something for you to do. An, uh, an event is something that the player isn't asked to do, but something that just happens. So, for instance, uh, somebody comes in and says, I want to talk to you and starts a conversation. Or uh, a structure suddenly appears in the game. Or uh, two of the other players in the game decide to create an alliance or break an alliance, etc. We'll get back into it later. But these are events, something that the player didn't trigger that I want to have trigger at some point in the game, right? The other thing is, uh, uh, we'll talk about the fails here in a second. The other big one is uh, a trigger. And a trigger is, I want to declare at this point in time something in this game has changed and I want everything else in the game to be able to reference that. Most obvious uh, version of that would be uh, turns passed. So I might say, when 30 turns have passed, I want to set the trigger of blah. And so now everything else can use in this prerequisite column either a goal ID, a trigger ID, or an event ID, and the ID is simply the, the uh, thing that tells me which one of those it is. So for instance, this is goal ID, uh, mission 001, goal 01, which is occupy this hex. So I can now say with a prerequisite, don't do this thing until this other thing is over. So I might say, look, occupy this hex. And then when you're done occupying this hex, that will create the prerequisite of mission goal zero one has been completed. So now go do uh, uh, whatever that has prerequisite zero one set in it. So later on, I might say for this one, 
um, M001 underscore G01, which means when you're done with goal number one, that means the prerequisite for goal number three has been set, which means goal number three will start. Now, maybe I don't want that to start immediately, right? Maybe I want that to start 10 turns after something, or maybe I want that to start uh, 50 turns into the game. I can set that with a trigger or I can set that with an event. So I can have an event occur at a certain time set by a trigger, etc. So I can create a whole structure based on these prerequisites for when I want things to happen, right? This win column basically says, is this something I have to do to win the game? So some of these goals might be uh, not necessary to win the game. And importantly, I don't officially, because there has to be some declaration of when did I win? When when do you win this game? Well, you win this game when all of the goals that have a win condition of yes a set assigned to it have been completed. So I can say, all right, these are the five things you have to do to complete the game. If you've done these five things, yay, you've won the game. So that's that's how we say, how do you win the game? It can be any set of goals that I put together, right? Uh, the team ID, and this is important, the team ID is actually telling you who does this actually apply to? And what's interesting about this is we can actually set these goals, not just for the player, but we can set them for the AI. So one of the ways in which we can tell the AI how to behave is to give them a goal. So for instance, I might start the game with uh, a goal of defend this unit, you know, try to keep this unit from dying, I can assign that to team five, which is one of the AI players. And now that AI knows what it's supposed to be doing in the game. It's supposed to be keeping this unit from dying and it will behave in such a way that it will do that. Now, obviously there's a bunch of code involved in that, that I don't write that, you know, the coder will have to write, which we figure out, well, what does it mean when I tell the uh, when I tell the, the game to have this unit defend that. I don't know what that means, but that's a whole different thing that has to be coded. But at least now as a designer, I can assign it and say, hey, you try to defend that unit. That's what I want you to do, right? Um, and I can also assign that to uh, the player. So that would actually pop up a mission for the player. Hey, defend this unit or kill this thing or do whatever the hell that needs to be, right? Um, so the type, these are all the kind of different goals that we might have. Occupy this hex, defend this unit, own this structure, uh, go get a bunch of gold, own a unit, raise a structure, own a structure, etc., etc. Um, these, this is a short list that I came up with of the obvious ones. And then we can actually set a number of parameters for this, which tell me, well, tell me more about this goal. So in Occupy hex, the hex ID or the waypoint ID, which we've talked about already, uh, what hex do you want me to occupy? Well, this hex, right? Um, and then we can say, well, who has to occupy it? Well, we could say faction with a faction ID. So I could say Dark Talon, which means one of my Dark Talon units needs to be the one that's on that hex. Or I could say, you know what? I want um, one of my infantry units to be the one that goes on that hex. And I can declare that by class. Or I can say, you know what? This hero, Morgan or 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 uh, what's one of my heroes? Uh, Tristan. Tristan has to be the guy that goes on this thing. Um, you know, or you know, it actually. Uh, I I might say you have to have a militia unit. Could be any militia unit, but it has to specifically be this type of unit. The next one down, the unit ID is actually saying this specific unit, this one right here, which has a unit ID attached to it. That's the one that has to do that. Where is this unit ID set? Well, it's set right here. When I set up my units, I assigned a unit ID to something. So maybe when I started the game, I created a heavy horse unit, uh, which was this faction 0102. And I said, you are now called uh, unit uh, 001, right? So unit 001, which I probably wouldn't do. I would probably call it unit uh uh, first horse. So now I know, okay, I've assigned this unit first horse. That's the first horse that you start the game with. Then when I go over to actions and I say, all right, what, what are you supposed to be doing? Okay. Uh, you're, the, that horse has to go occupy this hex. So I can actually add in this parameters unit first horse. And that would tell me, you know, oh, okay. It has to be that guy. Right. And this, this basic structure works for all of these things. I could go through all of it, but it's really boring and there's a bunch of stuff there. But now we know, all right, I need this, I need to set up a goal. And then you say, well, how does the player know anything? How does he know that this is happening? What do we communicate to the player? Aha, that's where these come in. 
right? So first of all, the duration, that is the, how long do I have to finish this quest? So uh, this falls in the, you have to take this castle within 10 turns. I put 10 turns here, that goes in duration. Um, then we have, when you start this, what dialogue are you gonna play? What are you gonna, what are you gonna, how are you gonna express this to the player? So we're gonna call a dialogue and we're gonna talk in a minute about how dialogues are made. We'll get to that. Um, but. Uh, later we will have a, this is how dialogues are made. Um, then when you end, uh, you, you play another dialogue and you, you don't have to, uh, you can leave this blank. Maybe it doesn't have a dialogue, uh, depends on what you want it to do, but it would also have a title and a quest text, which is, this is what shows up over on the left-hand side of the screen. So maybe this is, you know, uh, get to the old mill, right? And the point that I'm trying to get to is the old mill. And I call the quest title, get to the old mill. And the quest text would be, uh, hey, get to the old mill within 20 minutes or whatever. I've got whatever that is. Um, and importantly, some of this stuff should be able to reference some of these other things. So for instance, my quest text might be something like get to the um, old mill uh, within, and then what's the duration? Well, actually, I don't want to, I don't want to constantly have to be updating this every time somebody changes this and says, hey, you know what, let's make this goal a little longer. So instead, why don't I put a parameter in here, um, which I can mark with a couple of these little percentage signs before and after. And inside of this, I can write duration, right? Um, and what that does is it says, all right, get to the old mill within, well, what's this duration? Well, the duration is whatever the fuck was in this column right here. And it says, oh, okay, that was 15. So now it's gonna say, get to the old mill within 15 turns. Well, you know what? Maybe I don't want the old mill. Maybe what I want is I want this to be a call to um, a waypoint, waypoint underscore uh, old mill, right? And so now I know, okay, that waypoint old mill thing, that's actually the name of the waypoint that I set up over here, right? And I probably need to add a column for, for the text of what that is. Um, but then it would go look in the, uh, it would go look in the localization file and say, well, what did I call that waypoint? Well, I called that waypoint the old mill. And now when it calls it over here in actions, it says, oh, okay, get to waypoint old mill within the returns. So now I have that information available to me. Um, seems a little bit complicated, but this is actually the best way to do it. Um, well, it's not the best way. It's the way I've come up with, which I think is the best because I came up with it. Um, anyway, that's goals. The next thing is uh, events. These are things that happen during the game. They're handled exactly the same way. I just tag it as an event, which means it's not a goal, it's an event. I give it its own ID. Um, and then again, what kind of event? Well, this is a conversation. What happens in this conversation? Well, I give you this dialogue ID, which says, go start this dialogue. What about adding a unit? Well, what type of unit? What hex do I put them on? What's the unit ID that I give that so that it now has a name so that I can reference that unit somewhere else in some other piece of script? Blah, 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 right? So all of these have that kind of thing attached to it. So you now know, oh, okay, this is how these things work, right? Triggers, same thing. I assign a trigger, the concept that you are a trigger. I give it an ID. And now I can say different kinds of triggers. Simplest kind of trigger, for instance, turns of past, right? So now it's saying, I need a, uh, I need a thing to happen uh, at some point. At what point? Well, whenever this happens, right? When this happens, when the trigger happens, nothing happens. Like the trigger doesn't itself do anything. But what it does is it creates the understanding of trigger M01, T01 has occurred, which means now I can actually set up five events and uh, two goals. I can set up a whole bunch of stuff, which all goes off that one trigger. And the reason I want to do it that way, you know, I obviously could set up a trigger column in each one of the uh, events and say, all right, what triggers this event, this prerequisite or this triggered condition. But now I have to later on when I build a big complicated event where it's like, okay, I want to spawn these five units and I want to break this alliance and I want all this other shit to happen. Every time I want to adjust that, I have to go through each one of those events and adjust that trigger. It's better to externalize that and say, let's build a trigger, right? Now I have a trigger and now I can adjust this trigger whenever I want 
and and I only have to adjust it once, and everything that falls off of that trigger will be adjusted at the same time. It's a cleaner way of doing this. So now I've got my trigger. The last thing I've got is fail conditions. These are specific conditions where, um, when do you lose this game, right? Obvious, in pretty much every one of the missions will have an end turn fail condition, which is, all right, this is how many turns you have to finish this mission, right? But there might be other fail conditions, like uh, if this unit dies, then you fail the mission. And that's only there if I assign it to be there. Or maybe if this structure is killed, then you have lost the mission. Or maybe the enemy has been assigned a goal, and the enemy has reached that goal. So maybe I assign an enemy the goal of um, owning 15 towers, right? Which I can set up here with this own structure, right? So I say to the U U UI, or the UI, sorry, I say to the AI, um, you need to go own structure of N equals 10 type equals watchtower, which now tells the AI, oh, go build 10 watchtowers. That's what you're supposed to be doing. So now the AI knows to go build 10 watchtowers, right? And I assign that to player four because that's the player who's supposed to be building watchtowers. I can then go create a fail condition, which says if the enemy achieves whatever goal that was, we decided that was goal M001G06, all right, the enemy has completed M0106, that means you have lost the game. And we, there's a little bit more that we need to put in here of, all right, would you immediately lose or do you have X number of turns? Um, I think we need to probably put in a parameter here, which is um, time, this is how many, uh, the time you have to fix before losing. So now we can say, all right, uh, goal ID, blah, 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 time end. So the minute they make eight watchtowers or 10 watchtowers, however many it was, it now starts a timer and says, you have, you know, so-and-so has made 10 watchtowers. You now have 10 turns to fix this before you lose the game. And that counts down each time. So there you go. There's that. Um, so now you're asking, what about these dialogues, Chris? You keep talking about these dialogues. Well, what is a dialogue going to look like? Well, uh, for those of you who played Kalasia, this will seem uh, pretty familiar. Um, th this is kind of what I'm assuming the dialogues are going to look like, where we have a character who tells me some shit, and we have another character who gives me some choices. Now, importantly, it may not look exactly like this. It may be a character tells me some stuff, then another character says some stuff, and then another character says some stuff, and then a character gives you choices. Or maybe this character gives me choices. We can mix this up however we want, but basically there's two kinds of things that can happen. One, somebody tells me something, or two, somebody asks me what I'd like to say, and that will create choices. So, that takes us to the dialogue tab, right? And in the dialogue tab, we can create a dialogue, right? Um, when we start a dialogue, it has uh, a series of dialogue bits. So let's say, for instance, um, in actions, I said, okay, um, I want uh, to start the conversation of start pop. Or where was it? Um, I thought I had one listed. Here we go. So uh, start dialogue right here. So let's say I create uh, M001 start dialogue, right? Um, M001 start dialogue. I can now take that thing over here. And, uh, I think this is actually start dialogue, uh, which is really long and I'll probably make something shorter, right? Now, if this is going to have a number of phases, I append an A, B, C to the end of it. Excuse me. A, B, uh, C which tells me those are different parts of the one big dialogue M001, G01, start dialogue, which again, I'll make a shorter name, but anyway, that's, that's the dialogue we're talking about. So it's going to ask me some questions, right? Uh, what's the character ID, right? And so the character ID for this dialogue, right? Because this, if you look at this thing right here, this is actually composed of two pieces of dialogue, right? The top and the bottom, right? So right now we're defining the top. The top is what character ID? What's his ID? So somewhere I have a code that says that's, you know, uh, I believe that's the hand of Zangor. Um, and he's going to tell me some stuff, right? Ask me which location do I want him on? Do I want him on the left or the right? I guess I want him on the left. 
Uh, what text do I want? Here's the text that shows up in the block text. Now you notice the choice columns and the action columns are left blank because there are no choices. There's nothing to do here other than read what the hell he has to say. So the next bit of it is this start dialogue underscore B, which is Olivia is now talking to me. So uh, what character ID? Well, the Olivia character ID. What location? Right, because she's over on the right. She doesn't have any block text. She's not telling me block text. She's actually giving me a number of choices, up to three possible choices. For each one of the three possible choices, I give some text. So this first one would be with pleasure. The second would be what's in it for me. The third one would be I've changed my mind. I'll kill you first, right? So that's how we tell you what that thing is. The next thing is, all right, if I clicked any one of these things, what the hell happens? And with these, I can now say, Oh, go to a new dialogue. So maybe I skip forward to start dialogue underscore F because I don't need C or D or whatever, right? Maybe I end, maybe that's the end of the conversation. Or maybe I set a keyword. And when I set a keyword, that means I can now use that keyword back over in my actions to say, uh, did that trigger a trigger, right? So for instance, I can set a keyword as an event, right? And I can use as a trigger, keyword has been set. So in this case, maybe I set the keyword uh, alliance with Olivia. Now that I've set the keyword alliance with Olivia and I set that up as a trigger here, that trigger then triggers the alliance with Olivia. I then go to my events and I say, okay, Olivia is now allied to me, which is the part of this alliance. So I set up an alliance, me and Olivia. So yay, I'm now allied to Olivia. And oh, by the way, Olivia wanted 500 gold to ally with me. So I will also adjust my gold minus 500. Um, and then, okay, now that I'm allied with Olivia, well, Olivia's great big enemy is the uh, player four. So now I can add another alliance event, which is player four is now breaking their alliance with Olivia. And not only that, I can go and say, you know what, uh, player four wants to go destroy something and I need to set up another type, which is, uh, you know, attack so-and-so player. So, you know, now I've got a sort of full set of what all that does. So anyway, that's how this works. So for those of you who were watching me mess around with this yesterday and wonder what I was doing, um, you know, interestingly, the hard part of this is not what you think it is. When you look at this, you think the hard part is coming up with this list of defend unit, defend structure, what are all these things. That's not actually the hard part. The hard part is coming up with the structure and thinking about is this structure going to do all of the things that I need it to do? And actually, there's a couple things that even going through this, this discussion, I thought, oh, okay, there's some other stuff I would probably do differently or I need to change. And I'm sure we're going to have a discussion about that later today. Some of this will get adjusted. Adrian will actually get to building this today. Once Adrian starts building this today, he'll probably find some stuff where he's like, ah, Chris was wrong. We should do it this way. None of this will survive contact with a programmer. And whatever the co programmer puts together will not survive contact with a designer when we actually try to build something. And that's just the way game development works. It's not. It's nothing to get upset about. That's the process. But you have to start this process with a serious think about this because this scripting system will be our lives for the next you know four or five months. Once this thing is up and running, it's time to go build the single player missions. And once it's time to build the single player missions, uh, basically Nelson and I will be working with this for literally months on end. And assuming the game does well, we'll be working with this for potentially years. And so this thinking, you know, time spent right now, you know, taking a week to really mess with this and make sure that we love it and make sure it's done the way that we want it to be done. This is time well spent. And actually, once we get started, even stuff like my naming conventions, how am I naming stuff? How am I naming my waypoints, etc.? Uh, this is a first go at it. I can already tell you I don't like it because a lot of stuff is really long. Um, long stuff gets really uh, irritating. It also gives you lots of opportunities to misspell things, and those misspellings, of course, create bugs. So there's, there's a whole next part of this process, which is you know, actually applying this and seeing if we like it or we don't like it. Um, but this is where we are. And for those who were wondering, what, what was Chris doing yesterday? That's what I was doing. And 
I hope that's helpful. I hope that's interesting to everybody. And maybe maybe there's other young developers out there who are wondering how games get developed. And you know, one of the things is I am 100% certain there are game developers watching this right now in stream, or there are game developers who are going to watch this video who are going to be like, dude, I totally would not have done it that way. That's cool. You don't have to do it this way. You don't have to set up your stuff in Excel. I like Excel because we can validate things and because we can deal with a lot of data easily and I can see a lot of data easily in this format. Part of the reason we use Excel, to be very frank, is I have an MBA and I spent two years learning how to use the hell out of Excel back in 2006 and we built the studio back then. So back then I was very Excel minded and we used Excel as a tool back then and we've been using it for so long now that I really kind of get how to do stuff in Excel and I get how to build one of these in Excel. There's a good argument to be made for, you know what, you could do all of this way simpler just putting a text file together and writing a simple scripting language and scripting this all out with a text file. You could, you could certainly do it that way. Um, and there are arguments for why that might be an easier way to do it. And if you were from a different, uh, if you were from a different studio or a different background, that might actually be a better plan for you. There's another argument to be made for putting together some kind of graphics interface for this, where you actually drag little blocks around and attach little blocks with arrows and stuff and build an editor like that. And there are editors you can go pick up off the shelf that do that where you could build stuff like that. There's there's a hundred ways to skin this cat. Um, and it's, it's difficult for me to say that this way is better or worse than someone else's way, but this is kind of the way we do it around here because of, you know, this is the way I think, and this is the way that we trained our designers to think. Everything we've built, we built something like 50 some odd games using various scripting engines all based off of Excel, which by the way, we don't actually use Excel in the game. There's a big export button that you could go press in the, the real data sheet, which actually exports this all to a Lua file. And the game actually reads the Lua file. And if you look at the Lua file, there's actually no reason why we couldn't just write Lua files. That's certainly a possibility. But, um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different ways this could be done. Um, over in, in chat, you know, I've got people saying you could use a database uh, for the record. Excel is a database, but no, there's all kinds of different ways that this could be done. And I'm certain that there are going to be people that watch this on YouTube and think, wow, that's a really back asswards way of doing it. I totally would not have done it like this. I would have done it this way. And that's fine. That's, that's, that's how they work. And this is how we work. Um, so there's all of that. Um, one thing that uh, I think is strong about the Excel model is, uh, for one, your main editing tool is one of the best tested pieces of software on the planet. I mean, Excel largely doesn't have bugs, largely doesn't crash. Your development environment in Excel couldn't be more professional. This is one of the top pieces of software in the history of man. So, you know, you're working on a very robust piece of software. And it has all kinds of very robust tools. I can find things, I can search, replace things. And you know, I, as a development studio, never have to touch those tools. It's a, Microsoft has done this for me, it's a great tool. Um, so that's one of the real strengths. Another strength of it is um, it's very visual and it's very easy to take somebody who hasn't done this kind of stuff their whole life and hand them Excel, spree and Excel spreadsheet and say, this is how we do it. And they can get it quite quickly. Uh, usually it's a little less imposing than here, have this uh, huge Lua file that you have to go in and edit. And then the, the thing I really like about it is we can validate things. So for instance, this thing that says element map point player, I can actually, val and I will later on when we make the real sheet, I'll validate this column and say, look, if you don't write map point player or unit, it's gonna give you an error message and say, you've written the wrong thing here. And so now I've eliminated the possibility that somebody went through and wrote uh, because he was typing fast and now that, that would create a bug. This would not work, right? And if this were a Lua file, it would be very difficult to go through and find that. But I can actually get Excel to say, look, unless you write player, it's wrong. And in fact, I can actually get Excel to say, here is a drop down menu of the four things that you're allowed to put in this column. And you click and you drop down and you do it. And that's trivial. I can, I can build that tool in about 10 seconds. So there's a lot that we can do in Excel to uh, keep people from messing things up. So anyway, there's all that. I hope that was fun for everybody.
and uh, we'll be back. I'm going to be doing more of this kind of stuff, little short uh, things like this, because people seem to be enjoying them, and I'm trying to get uh, more of our development out there. I know people like watching the live streams where I talk about my life and whatnot, but I'm trying to do a little bit more of the live streams where we actually show some real work, and this is, this is it. This is what we actually do. So thank you very much for coming. I will let you get back to your regularly scheduled lives. Um, I will put on the, uh, I've got somewhere a thing. There, that, that's my, my end thing. Thank you very much, and we'll see you later.